Uh, Australia has a proud tradition of increasing the productivity of its agriculture and in particular this graph shows a 90 year period in which uh, yield increased threefold um, by increasing at about 10 kilograms per hectare per year. Also note the highly variable nature of our yield and, and the need for looking at a prolonged period to determine a long-term trend. More recently, uh, in a paper published by some colleagues of mine, uh, the various drivers of, of productivity were uh, itemised and they go from uh, new technologies, including new varieties, uh, better uh, attention, a higher attention given to um, management, larger farms, more mechanisation, more specialisation in farming, uh, changes in systems uh, such as uh, no-till farming, integrated weed management, conservation farming, uh, and, and the employment of specialist advice on farm. So all these things are driving improved productivity right now and have been for the last 20 odd years. And yet, when we look at the trend since 1990, uh, there is no significant trend. And so we've, uh, we're looking at 26 years of stagnation in wheat yield. And Australia is not alone in observing uh, such a trend. In fact, it's been estimated that up to 3% of cropping lands around the world um, are showing a similar trend, and a lot of those are in developing countries. So the question is why? And, and that was uh, the question that's driven our research. Um, th there are internationally in the literature some uh, suggested drivers for this, and uh, here's a list of ones that we don't think are big drivers uh, in Australia. And so government regulation, you've heard uh, from uh, representatives of, of our government about how much our government is actually encouraging productivity in agriculture. Uh, and this is in contrast to, say, uh, Europe, uh, where the emphasis has been on other um, uh, imperatives. Uh, you saw uh, in yesterday's ABS uh, presentation that, uh, that, in fact, it seems from the figures that uh, R&D, when you factor in uh, private investment in R&D, is actually increasing, and especially if you look at cropping, R&D is increasing. Um, we, uh, uh, soil fertility, actually the rate of decline in the last 20 years uh, is, is drastically reduced compared to previous rates and, and that's because of conservation, farming, zero till, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, ex uh, wheat has been expanding over this period but much of that expansion has been into wetter rather than drier country and uh, to the degree that it's replaced uh, sheep, uh, this has often meant moving into uh, higher organic matter soils and, and so unlikely that that is a, is a driver. And this leaves climate. Now, Neil uh, actually gave a, an updated version of this map, uh, but basically we've seen a trend of higher temperatures and drier um, cropping season rainfall in the, in the um, grain zone of Australia. Uh, I, just to add to that, that uh, atmospheric CO2 has increased um, and uh, that, that is actually in itself a positive for crop growth. So uh, how do we translate uh, that climate data into it, it, that sort of I guess, general picture of the climate trends into an understanding of what's happening to wheat. And what we've done is we've selected 50 weather stations, and these uh, were selected primarily because they have the most complete record in a period since uh, 1972, which, which uh, is a period we've studied. Um, and they each have a minimum area of cropping around them, so we want them to be relative, uh, um, relevant to wheat cropping. Um, they also uh, are placed so that they represent more than 90% of the agroecological zones in which we grow wheat. Uh, 
and they also uh, happen to also represent the major soil types that we grow wheat on in Australia. So when we looked at maximum daily temperatures during crop growth over those 50 years, um, and, and this graph is just sort of showing you the variability in, in the spatial distribution of that as well as the central tendency, um, it, it's a subtle line, but it is a subtle line that means a one, more than a one degree change over this period, which is a lot in terms of the effect on crop growth. Uh, a less subtle line is showing you the decline in rainfall over these 50 weather stations, and that means on average 71.8 millimetres decline over that 26 year period. So taking this information about the climate, and we're now talking about specifically 50 locations, um, we use the APSIM model to simulate the impact of that on crop growth. Uh, I just, uh, I, I, you know, I could give a whole talk about the APSIM model, but we just want to say we capture both the amount of rainfall and the distribution effect. We capture the seasonal conditions of temperature, radiation, CO2, soil types play a role. Uh, and in trying to determine the yield potential, uh, what we've done is we've used best management practice in terms of sowing rules, in terms of the varieties, so we're assuming the best varieties over the whole period, no change over time, uh, and that nitrogen management is non-limiting. Now, it's a feature of this model that uh, it's not limited by weeds, pests, diseases, and extreme climate events, which means it's actually conservative about the effect of any changes we've had in the climate. Um, and APSIM has been validated in the field over hundreds of experiments and, and many seasons. So when we translate that weather information into yield potential, uh, what we have observed is that over this 26 year period, uh, there's been a decline in yield of 27 kilograms per hectare per year. And that amounts to a 1.2 ton per hectare reduction in yield potential. Note that I keep saying yield potential, I'll get back to that in a moment. Um, the, the P value represents the probability that this could be happening by chance alone. And what that is saying is that the probability of just uh, random climate variability driving such a decline is less than one in 100 billion. Now that was the magnitude of it. The other side of the story is its distribution. It's not evenly distributed around the uh, cropping zone. And uh, what you can see, so Lee would be very relieved for his beloved South Australia that's not doing too badly, relatively speaking. Um, and and the, uh, the, the, the redder colours are around New South Wales, Victoria, and uh, the western, uh, sorry, the eastern part of Western Australia. Oh, and, and just an important point is that there is no part, none of those 50 weather stations showed a positive trend. So what's driving this? We, we've talked about the climate, but let's try and break that down a bit. And so what we've done is we conducted two virtual experiments using APSIM, uh, one in which we detrended the temperature trend. It's just a statistical method of saying, what if temperature had stayed the same? Um, we're still allowing for variability, but we're taking out the long-term trend. And that shows that instead of uh, reducing yield by 47 uh, kilograms per hectare, we would only be reducing it by 39 kilograms per hectare per year. Uh, so the effect of rising temperature on its own, and I should stress on its own because it combines with rainfall in, in, in reality, uh, is, uh, is just eight kilograms per hectare per year. Uh, and we also looked at CO2 because especially in the kind of climate denial uh, vernacular, the CO2 is uh, great food for plants and, and we shouldn't worry about rising CO2. Well, indeed CO2 uh, does 
uh, improve the situation without rising CO2, um, we would be looking at 54 kilogram per hectare per year. So those two things virtually cancel each other. And in reality, the, it, it's the drop of rainfall that's explaining 83% of the drop in yield potential. So as I said, we, I've been talking about the yield potential. That's the most that farmers uh, can possibly produce. Uh, in reality, economic pressures, etc., mean that uh, the best farmers or the most sort of production-oriented farmers can produce about 80% of that yield potential. But uh, on average, in Australia, looking over a 15-year period, uh, the, the recent 15-year periods, we're looking more at about 50% of that yield potential being realised uh, by farmers. And there was a presentation yesterday which showed the difference between the top 25 and the bottom 25% of farmers, and that's where a lot of that action is. Um, and so because farmers are only producing half of what a potential is, then you would expect that the reduction in yield would only be half of what it would be otherwise, okay, of the, of the potential. Um, but we do have a very strong correlation between potential yield and actual yield. And when we look at those 50 weather stations and the yield potential of those against the national yields, uh, they are very highly correlated. And when we add a factor of time into it, which is the technological improvement that's taking place, uh, which, which uh, in this uh, formula here is about 25 kilograms per hectare per year improvement due to technology improvements. Um, we explain 86% of the variability from in year to year um, production. So closing the yield gap by 25.2 kilograms per hectare cancels out the expected 23 kilograms per hectare decline in yield. Another way of looking at that is to look at that how much of the, um, of the potential yield, what percentage of that potential yield is being realised. And it's gone up from 38% to 55%. Um, over, this, over this period, which is another way of showing how farmers are compensating for the worst conditions by exploiting more of the yield potential that's available to them. So just in conclusion, stagnant yields in the last 26 years are fully accounted for and more by that uh, 47 kilogram per hectare negative trend in yield potential. Uh, the, this negative trend is highly unlikely to be random, uh, just due to regular expected climate variability alone. The, um, these yield declines are explained very well by water stress conditions and by the temperatures hastening um, the period in which yield can be formed. And the increased CO2, atmospheric CO2, just um, slightly compensates for the trend which uh, is caused by the warming and drying of the grain zone. And finally, uh, farmers, by adopting new technologies and the hard work done by the research community, by the extension community, um, etc., has just enabled farmers to keep up. Uh, we're working very hard to stay on the same spot. Um, do I have another minute? Okay, because um, I know that everyone's thinking, okay, well, you've given us this doom and gloom, but uh, what about last year? <laughs> How come we had such a record year last year? Well, just to put that into perspective, um, I've just added the one year uh, to, to the analysis that we had before. Um, and 
so if you look at maximum daily temperatures, this is this, is this year, last year. There are a couple of examples of similar years in the past, um, but, but this is actually the big difference um, in, in this year. Rainfall, again, um, you know, we, we are looking at an exceptionally good season, but, you know, back in 94, we were not too different from that. And of course, counterbalancing that year are some very dry years that are part of that trend. When we look at the yield trend and we include this last year, um, instead of 47, we go to 36. But you can bet on return to the mean. So we would still hold that the 47 number is more indicative of the trend we're observing than just adding one year, just as if we would have stopped, say, in 2006 after a drought and we would have seen a worse trend. But statistically significant, the statistical significance of this trend is just as strong as it was before. And the trend of, and, and this is assuming um, ABEAR's current prediction of what the, the yield w will be for 2016, the trend of farmers increasing adoption and that 55% is bang on target. So that trend again is also holding strong.